Hello everyone, my name is Peter, Peter van der Graag. I am with the team uh, that supports the global ecosystem restoration communities movement. Um, probably in the next few weeks, a few more will actually be added to the movement. It's a continuous growing group of initiatives that are um, physically doing what John has just said, providing hope, I think, for people worldwide and uh, um, a future for the generations that come. Um, briefly, uh, today, it's a fireside chat. Uh, we do these months. I shall unmute myself again. I think I'll blame Kath for muting me. <laughs> um, if you could mute yourself, <laughs> and maybe even turn off your video because some people around the world do not have the bandwidth that uh, many of us are afforded with. And if there's a lot of videos going on, uh, those people will not be able to see what we are, uh, what's happening here or, or hear what we're talking about because it will be jumpy and stalled or even break down. So if you could turn off your video if you're not speaking, that would be great. And also your sound. Um, then we can then we can continue. Uh, there are still people coming in, and Kath, uh, who muted me, and I will never forgive her. Uh, <laughs> she she will continue to let those people in. Uh, so don't worry about that. If you see those people um, arriving in the waiting room, um, usually we start with a with a PowerPoint with all the stuff that's happening because but because it's so early in the year, not much has been planned yet for the rest of the year. So. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to invite you to come to our website. Uh, ERC.earth is the quickest way to type it in. If you want, if you want into full URLs, it's ecosystemrestorationcommunities.org.earth, uh, but ERC.earth works too. And then go to the participate part of the website and check that regular, regularly. You'll see what each of these ERCs is organizing that you could participate in yourself. Um, more long-term volunteer roles, uh, expertise that's being requested. It would be great if you visit or tell your friends, and if you know experts, to tell them to come and visit that website so that they um, that they can become involved in the work of this growing community of initiatives. Um, today, um, I think I still need to. I think am I still allowed? I wish you a happy 2024. Um, Someone said it's not 2024, but 2020 more. Not more of the stuff that gets us all depressed and down, but more of the stuff that gives us hope and a future uh, that we believe is worth uh, working towards uh, for all of those that all of us that live on this planet. And that's not just humanity. So um, happy 2020 more of the good stuff then from me. Um, that's all I have to say. Uh, we have John, who is going to briefly sort of reflect on what he's been thinking about in the last few weeks, and he's already started a bit. And then after that is the um, the, the the keynote, if you could say it that, uh, around a fireside, uh, around a fireplace. It's Guy, Guy Tiesi from Farm of the Future all the way in Brazil, uh, in a wonderful location, right on the point where the Pantanal, the Cerrado and the Amazon come together along the Uruguayo River, uh, and he's uh, amidst many of the newly emerged soy farms there in the past 10 years, trying to form this beacon of sustainability, regeneration, and restoration. Uh, he'll get most of the time today. Um, if you, um, uh, uh, and after that, we'll open the floor to everyone here, uh, because it's a fireside chat, and uh, it comes from the idea of camping together, trying to restore this planet. And then after we're done, after a hard day's work, we light a fire, we sit around it, and we go a little bit deeper in who we are and what we're doing and what's motivating us and trying to learn more from each other. And that's what these fire chat side chats are about in this virtual online world of Zoom. But it is supposed to be as informal as that. So please feel free to come in with whatever you wish to come in with. After Guy is done, ask him questions or present something yourself. We can have a conversation. 
Um, we usually try to uh, end around 7.30 my time in the evening. Uh, wherever you are in the world, it's currently 6.11 where I am. Um, but if it has to, if, if, if it continues to go on longer, we keep the Zoom open. People can continue to uh, have conversations if you have time and if you have the energy for that. Some of us will have to go and cook dinner. I am one of those people. Anyway, um, that's all that I have to tell you about. Uh, I'd love to give it back to John, who has just visited the Lust Plateau, which is basically the... The, the, the well, if, you, if you want to use that term, the match that lit the fire of ecosystem restoration, I think, around the planet. John. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And Happy New Year to everybody. Um, no, go ahead. It's, uh, hey, I think if, it, if it's possible for everyone to mute, if they're not speaking, it would be very useful at this time. And um, it's, it's really great to see this movement continuing and growing because we have the ability now to really do something. And we're seeing that mass, uh, mass collaboration and mass participation is the way forward. And that this is working everywhere in the world, that everywhere in the world needs to restore all degraded landscapes on the planet and that it, does it basically when we're facing these multiple multiple crises it's wonderful to have a solution that solves them all <laughs> and uh, ecological restoration really gives us purpose and it gives us something to do that's really not simply for selfish purposes for ourselves or even just for our families it's about caring for humanity and caring for life and caring for the earth. And when we really understand it, we can see how this relates to food security, to full employment, to health, physical health, psychological health, all of those things. So I have just come back last night from the Lus Plateau where I was meeting with the Chinese Academy of Sciences, the Institute of Soil and Water Conservation. I have a lot of friends there and there's a lot of new young PhD students there. And it's, it's pretty good fun to go there and see my friends and the new colleagues who are, who are joining in this work. They have done really good work. <clears throat> and we were joined by the director of the upper and middle reaches of the Yellow River Commission, who were, were the was the implementing unit in the Lus Plateau Watershed Rehabilitation Project, which I documented. Most of you know about my films and can watch them. I'll put some links into the into the chat, but if you haven't seen them, and um, it's interesting because. This year, 2024, is the 30th year since I first went out there and began the documentation by create, beginning to create the baseline study for the World Bank for this, this massive project. And I have to say, it really transformed my life because I had been a journalist covering the news. And I had covered some really big stories, China rising from poverty and isolation and Tiananmen and international terrorism and the collapse of the Soviet Union. But when I went to the Lis Plateau after 15 years of journalism and I saw the importance of ecology, I, I had this flash of intuition that ecology was just much more important than anything else I'd ever seen. And it's been 30 years <laughs> since then. And I was, I was 40, early 40s. And 
now I'm going to be 72. So it's uh, really throughout this period of study and observation and documentation and communication about this, I am more convinced now than I was when I had this first impression that human impacts on ecological systems needs to be understood. And today, we're going to hear from our colleague, Guy, in Brazil. And this is truly wonderful, what he's doing. And it's truly important, because this is a what I what I've started to realize and see is that there are acupuncture points on the earth. And these places, we need to understand what is the role. I mean, every place is important. I, I wouldn't say that there is any place that's not important, but there are certain places which are of extreme importance. And we can look at them in basically two ways. They're either functional or they're dysfunctional. And if they're functional, then that means that they're, they're in balance so that the oxygenated atmosphere, the water cycle, the soil fertility, and the biodiversity are intact. And the more I've studied this, the more I've realized that these biological processes are what altered the physics. So if we want to understand climate change, if we want to understand the weather, we, we want to ex understand extreme weather, we want to understand many of the disasters that we're seeing now. We've been, one of the things that we're looking at <clears throat> because of so, parts of our camps and communities, for instance, in California, the first camp in the United States was in Paradise, California, where the giant fire was. And now we're talking with, with Maui and other, other places because we're seeing events that were impossible before. So there, there's massive fires. And when you start to understand that these massive fires are not accidental, they're actually not natural uh, disasters, they're unnatural disasters, that we're human, human impact is causing by disrupting the natural systems that regulate humidity and temperature and wind speed, wind direction, and vortex activity. So now we're even seeing like fire tornadoes where the, 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 the systems are, are creating their own weather and something that was unheard of before is possible. So I just want everybody to know that we, each of us and all of us together, have a duty to restore the landscapes. Because if we do this, it's, it's going to change the course of human civilization. And it hasn't yet dawned on all of human civilization that this is the answer, but it will. Or we will fail. But I don't think we're going to, we can't fail. Hum, hum, humans, when we understand this, we're forced to, to do this. And so we all need to be part of this. We all need to figure out how we can collaborate with one another and how we can encourage mass participation on a planetary scale. So what's happening in Brazil is also happening around the world in different countries. And so it's lovely to hear what's happening. I, I was on an earlier call with Guy, and it's just fantastic what he's going to tell us. So enjoy this, and afterwards, let's talk. Thanks so much. Yeah, I won't. I won't get in between, Guy. It's it's all yours. We did see it for a second, Guy, and then it disappeared again, your PowerPoint. 
Okay, give me that. Almost there. Okay, there we go. Can you see and hear me well? Yes, I can. Good. Yes, from Beijing. Thanks. Yes. From Beijing. Good. Thanks, John, for the introduction. Thanks, Peter and Kev, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, we really had a very, very powerful and, and inspired conversation last week. And that made me work a little bit more in, in some slides to try to help me put the ideas together uh, in order to talk in maximum of 20 minutes with all of you. Uh, we're going to be talking uh, initially uh, from my, my personal transformation process in the beginning. Uh, we're going to talk about the three main principles that drive us as a farm of the future project. What makes us uh, wake up happy every every day? We're going to talk about the seven dimensions uh, that makes part today of what we call uh, our governments and development model of the farm of the future. And finally, I would like to spend some some time on the designing of the landscape, the territory and landscape design, and how we as a team are working on this architecture. Uh, to go from uh, a conventional farm to a farm village or to a, a farm of the future model. So uh, it's important to point that uh, I come from a huge city in Brazil. I come from Sao Paulo. I was born in Sao Paulo. I was graduated there in business. I still have as my main uh, cash flow business a consulting company that works with collaborative networks so what we see here back in 2015 it's a, a, a first meeting of a group of companies that makes part of the agribusiness in brazil uh, starting to work together to build a new future so my consulting company in brazil it's called value builders in, in sao paulo we started to make this kind of collaborative networks inside of the business uh, corporate people to promote in, uh, a new way of thinking. So that was basically the first step that I made to start talking about nature, to start talking about regenerative process inside of the big corporations. And that was back in 2015. In 2016, I really start the project uh, of the farm of the future here where I'm living now. I'm located in, in the southeast of the Amazon in a very beautiful river called Rio Araguaia, uh, which is basically uh, more than 2,000 kilometers from Sao Paulo. Uh, all this process from 2016 until now, it's a uh, Pretty good walk uh, uh, with a lot of challenges. Uh, we had two very big fires in the last five years. The last one in 2021, which uh, burned almost 70% of the farm, uh, which bring us on a always with a challenge of search for new energies to restart on cycles. So it's always a good walk to make this, this transition. Uh, talking about the three principles of the farm of the future, all the projects that you work that are kind of related with the seven dimensions, uh, they need to keep the forest standing and productive. That's the first principle. Uh, we need to community building in, in, in a var variety of ways. And, and third, uh, to promote the individual development. So every project, we make this kind of, of, of questions to see if we're going to keep the forest standing and productive, if we're going to build community and trust building, and if we promote anyhow uh, the individual uh, development. Well, uh, from 2016 until 2020, we've, we closed a cycle, what we call a first cycle of the farm of the future. 
where on these four year, basically uh, we we took a lot of people to camp. We did have we did not have a hotel structure, uh, elegant and simple as we have today. So we we had a, a camping very simple in the middle of the forest structure, and we took basically almost three hundred people in more than thirty five groups to camp and talk about the future of the territory. So uh, with all this conversation, we kind of uh, registered these seven dimensions. All the things that we talked about the future, they would fit in one of these seven dimensions. I'm gonna pass through uh, quickly, but uh, we're gonna pass through those seven dimensions. The first one is the forest school. The second one, the regenerative agriculture. The third one is the network entrepreneurship, how we make business together on a collaborative culture. The fourth dimension is the bio, a bioregional based ethnotourism. Number five, uh, the building and connection of biodiversity corridors. Number six, spirituality. And finally, the dimension number seven, renewable energies. So the, the, the forest school is, is basically the most important dimension that uh, we started to move in 2016 and 2000, 2017, uh, which uh, is bringing our, our education or learning process inside, inside of the territory. This picture here shows young people from, uh, from farming schools in the state that I'm living that comes to the farm to have courses on agroforestry system, for example. So we have partnerships with local uh, schools to bring young people to really make their practice uh, of learning in the forest school. And the forest school is not just related for young people, but it's, it's also working a lot with the families in the surrounding areas and with elderly people uh, putting uh, everybody together in the learning process. Uh, here's one of the pictures uh, that was in our in our in the ecosystem restoration communities uh, Instagram uh, two or three years ago. We are here. We were here studying uh, uh, soil fertilization, the quality of the soil. Uh, the second uh, and very important dimensions is how we're dealing with the regenerative agriculture. We are on a very tropical uh, region. So everything here really regenerates very fast by itself if you just let nature on, 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 on their own speed. But we need to, need to implement some logic to produce food using technologies that respect uh, nature cycles. So we started basically with two main projects in, in the regenerative agriculture perspective. One is the agroforestry integrated system with no animals. So where you can see here the pictures uh, where we, we plant different species in the same area with some, some techniques and logics. So each species has a role to play uh, in, this, in the integrated system. Uh, and the second one uh, is uh, a very important uh, methodology of, of Brazilian cattle raising, which combines the cattle uh, with the forest component. So it's, it's uh, uh, we call here ILPF. It's an integrated system with cattle, forest, and also the agriculture, also in the same area. So here you can see pictures that th those pictures were from two years ago. Uh, these pictures are from uh, last week. Uh, so we can see the difference. You can see the girls here hugging the trees on the right side. And then here you can also see on a small proportion, but you can, you can see the, the cow uh, under the same tree two years, two years after the, 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 the picture on, on the other slide. So those are teak. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, a tree originally from the, the Asian area. From, it's uh, the sacred uh, tree of India. And it grows uh, really fast, combining with the pasture uh, and having a lot of uh, opportunities to, to produce, for example, also the honey, 
it's a very good flower to produce honey. So that's the second model of the regenerative agriculture. The, the third dimension, uh, it's what you call the network entrepreneurship. I bring that with a lot of energy from my 20 years of consulting on collaborative networks in, in Sao Paulo. And the first step was to establish a cooperative, a local cooperative with more than 25 local families uh, to try to produce together, buy resources together, and uh, mainly to have access to market. In the, in the left side, we have our store, which is called Curau e Natural, the, the same name as the cooperative that we, we founded. And the cooperative today helps local people to do uh, projects together, mainly on uh, family, family family agriculture and uh, local-based community tourism, since we are located in a very, very uh, beautiful area. Uh, the cooperative also started to look uh, for project, basic projects. We felt that we had a very uh, hard water problem. So here we see Maria and her husband, uh, on this, on their land, uh, our on land of 25 hectares, they didn't have any water anymore. So the cooperative started to hey, help. Well, not just... I am scared. Uh, so we started to 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 work with uh, the same uh, the same pump for 20 families, like uh, helping a group of families to to share the same project of having their own water so they could produce after that. The fourth dimension is the bioregion based ethnotourism. We are working with three different tribes in, in, that are located around us to bring, uh, uh, to, to put us together uh, to learn with each other and to receive people from outside to experience uh, how are uh, the, the, the indigenous, Brazilian indigenous life here in, in, in the Amazon, in the Tocantins, in the Araguaia River? Here we see pictures of the Crao, uh, the Crao's. They, they are really known for their ability to celebrate, to sing and dance. They, they really reach uh, a high frequency dancing, celebrating and singing. And they are already coming to the farm of the future, and we are already coming to their to, to, to their their village to exchange knowledge and to start doing good things together. Well, uh, we are talking about the, the main uh, dimensions: uh, spirituality, renewable energy, and uh, biodiversity corridors. We can talk in another opportunity. Uh, but now I'm going to jump in uh, in, a, in, a, in an important model, which talks about how we are making our design, our transition design, our landscape design. Yeah. So here we can see uh, the map of the firm of the future. It's like a rectangle uh, with 500 hectares. So we have like five kilometers long, one kilometers wide. Uh, on the left side, we can see a beach. This beach has, it's in the Araguaia River Beach. Uh, this beach has uh, like almost two kilometers uh, of length. And in this season of the year, it's all underwater. Uh, the river goes up, up to 10 meters every year, up and down. So during rainy season that we are right now, all these sand beach, they are underwater. And we have a lot of, uh, we have like the biggest uh, floated Amazon forest in our, in our regions, in our place, in the place that we are. Uh, here we started to, we, we took half of the farm and we are, we made that legally, uh, permanently uh, preserved. There is a legal model in Brazil that you as a owner of the land, you can protect it forever, independent on sales, uh, sale the property to another people in the future, independent on having my daughters uh, leading and running the farm in the future. Half of the farm, it's eternally protected. So it's the, the blank area where you see. The other areas that we have squares, that's where we are developing a model 
uh, with 10 hectares each one of these areas, and we call that agroforestry islands. Uh, in these areas, uh, we're going to have uh, three different families living together on these 10 hectares. And before having the three families, we have uh, a project design. And so we now are working on uh, a variety of different projects that are really uh, connected to the territory, uh, to, the, to what the territory has as its nat natural resource. So we're designing different kinds of projects that goes to from agroforestry system to honey productions, to uh, bioarchitecture, to cattle raising, uh, a, a lot of different varieties. Each kind of project has connection to one or some specific uh, agroforest islands. Uh, again, 10 hectares each one. On the left side, in the middle is my daughter, my older mom, daughter that lives in, in Amsterdam nowadays. Well, actually she's back to Brazil, the youngest still living in, the, in Holland. Plinio is my great brother and partner that helps me in this project activities. And on the left, Maria, which is one of the first child that's already living in the, in the farm of the future with her family. Uh, I'm going to talk about two specific, uh, specific islands. The one that I call Riven Island is where I'm living right now. So I am the first family uh, living in this, in this first island. Uh, I moved definitely from Sao Paulo to, to the Araguaia River uh, during pandemics in 2021. Uh, and the first movement that I made was basically to, to build on this area that we call the, the Ilha do Rio, the River Island, we started to, to make the hotel, the Jungle Lodge project. So here's where I live, it's my cottage, we call that the Oka Lodge. Uh, on the left side, was when, was, uh, when we started to make the construction in 2021, it took one year to have this uh, Oka Lodge and other nine uh, lodges ready to receive people. So we started in this island to focus on the regenerative tourism dimension. So it's one of the multi-business uh, value building uh, format that we have. And the hotel, the Jungle Lodge, it's one of the business that we, are, we have running nowadays in the farm of the future. And I'm the fir first family living there, uh, working on this project with Raquel, my wife, and we are waiting for a second and a third family to help us to run this business. Uh, as Satish Kumar likes to say, it's a uh, it's human scale business. So you have 10 cottages, 10 lodges, and three families can take a very, very, very close and good care of the, the, the guests that we're gonna be receiving uh, to be in our hotel. Guests that, that are going to be paying to stay and guests, local guests that already are working on local projects, using our hotel to get it together, to celebrate, to design new projects, and, and, and to build community. Uh, so that's the, the, the island uh, of the River Island, where we have the hotel as the main project. And we're going to have, as I told before, three families in working together. In the middle of the, this, we call the Cooperation Island. It's like a shared service island that's gonna support the 24 other uh, islands uh, to, with, with, uh, with pro uh, process like education. So we're gonna, we're gonna be having uh, the structure of the forest school in this area. We're gonna have our nature hospital. We're gonna have the hospital on this area. We know that uh, it, since the school and the hotel, uh, they're gonna they're gonna be very 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 different than the schools and hotels that we have today and and hospitals that we have today, but we are starting to make first movements and first prototyping to wait for people to come and together with community uh, build the hospital and the school for for instance. In this area also we're gonna have our library, our part of uh, spiritually meditation center our art craft area. We're gonna have also an area that we've gone process, uh, food processing. 
to produce and add value on the foods that organic foods you're going to produce in the farm. So that's the unique island where we will not have three families, but we're going to have up to 30 families working on this uh, shared service area. That's a picture that I met with the Caos in just five years ago. And I, when I was the first time with them, I felt that that's the design that we're going to have on this collaboration island, the shared service island. So the, the Caos, they built their house around this big circle. Uh, and, and that's where they connect to the sky. They have the connection with the big energy or the great sun. They call that the Papan. So our island of the, the, the shared service is going to be called the Papan Island. And the Karaos are working with us uh, already to, to make it the rituals uh, that is going to start this area in the farm of the future. Uh, I'm going to send you, uh, I can send you afterwards, uh, the architecture product that are inspiring us to build this central area, the Papan, the shared service area. Uh, we already made some first celebration and, and rituals uh, with, with people, local people, with tourists and with indigenous that are visiting us. Here was the first scratch that we made from this, this, this central area. So science, technology, arts and spirituality, spirituality uh, connect, connected with the, the north, south, east and west area. So we have this designing going on. And finally, uh, we have this challenge to work in three different levels of collaboration. So that's very important. That, that what's helping us since the beginning to create a collaborative culture to work together on a bioregional perspective. The first level of collaboration, it's the family level within agroforestry island. Uh, so you can see one of the islands, it's the Sumauma Island, where this island is going to produce milk. Uh, on a very, very natural and combine it with forest way. But the first level of collaboration will be among the three okay. families that are going to be living there. The first family, it's like the agroforest. You have a pioneer species. So the first family always is a family that has technical expertise and competence and energy to start up the project. The second family could be a combination of learning and helping. And the third family can be a, a learner family that can, can that will be in the future the family to be uh, the leading family and and process and, and make it uh, uh, make the succession process uh, going on. So the first challenge is how three families live and work together in how in different houses. Uh, 50 meters, 50 meters to 100 meters a house for each other, a common area, uh, but that's the first challenge, to regenerate collabor co collaborative culture within one of the islands with three families. The second level of collaboration would, would be uh, among the islands. So the 72 families, three families for each 20, one of the 24 islands, plus 30 families that are going to be living and working in the cooperation uh, area, in the Papan Island. Uh, doctors, uh, nurses, teachers, artists, and so on. So that's the second level, and where the, that's where the cooperative is, is already working. We have a lot of projects, each island, each island developing or planning one kind of projects that requires resource, requires expertise, requires a uh, future vision. So that's where we think the second level of collaboration inside of the farm of the future, inside of our 500 hectares territory. And finally, we have uh, the, the collaboration among the farm of the future and other farms in the region and other, other human settlements that already exist in our state uh, for almost 20, 30 years. We live in, a, in, the, in the newest Brazilian state. Uh, Tocantins has 33 years old and was a very, very poor area. So a lot of people that has no land, no roof, 
they was settled in our state. So we have already a lot of territories with 100 families, 150 families, 200 families living together, but struggle to be there, struggle to keep their life and the young people in contact with the field, in contact with the, the rural area. So the third level of collaboration, it's, gonna, it's already happening among territories inside of a bioregional area. So those are the three levels of collaboration. Uh, uh, we need to take a walk, a wide, a wide walk uh, as one. Uh, we need to synchronize our way to, to walk, to make our transition, to dream together, but really focus on the territory and in practical way to make things happen. So I would like to thank you uh, for, for this time and opportunity, and let's keep on our conversation. Oh, Guy, so much to unpack on everything you've said um, and the approach you've taken, which is uh, obviously quite uh, holistic, as they would say, uh, trying to combine forestry, nature conservation, food production, but also healthcare, education, um, and providing a place where people can live. In, in our preparatory call, you talked about this new province in Brazil and that many people were sort of moved there, um, <clears throat> I guess, to be out of the way or to be in a place where you could try to do something yourself. And now you're trying to combine that into this new approach on your land, splitting it in all these little islands where families can start to do their own, um, their own uh, businesses, if you want to call them that. Uh, living together in these spaces, I think it's a it's a it's a fascinating idea, and it comes. It's really it's really interesting from the perspective of how we as humanity can continue on this planet, on the land that is available, with the numbers that we will be in. The fact that you, as a private property owner, are opening up to all these new families to come and form a community, I think is is fascinating. I'm sure I'm not the only one. If you have any questions to Guy, if you would like to get it more clarified, a little bit better understood, um, he's here. So this is your chance. And um, otherwise, we'll, uh, I, I, you know, I'll have some more questions, but maybe first to the floor. If you haven't, you can, you can use chat if you're shy, but we're sitting around a fire. We all know each other, virtually speaking. Uh, so do feel free to just raise your hand. I'm happy to give you uh, the floor and we go from there. Sorry, Zoom has asked me which language I'm speaking. I did not know it was that difficult to understand. Anyway, um, please uh, feel free to ask something to Guy or to reflect or to to... He's open to criticism. I see uh, Andrew or Yora, who we know well. I don't know which one. Um, it's me. Raising the hands. Andrew, go ahead, Andrew. Uh, okay. Um, great to see the project. Very interesting to see that you're following the pattern of 100 or so families occupying an area. Really like that. Um, I'm a veteran of intentional communities, lived in a couple of those. And one of the things that I know uh pops up on a regular basis is conflict and i'd be really interested to know what strategies you might have on board for dealing with um conflict in your communities good question andrew and thanks thanks for asking uh i would say to you that the main strategy not to avoid because we consider conflicts very healthy when they are handling the good matter they are important right and, mm -hmm. and we are sure that we're going to have a wide diversity of people there. Uh, and we will have uh, good conflicts. But the main conflicts that I figure out in 20 years already uh, working with and, and knowing different projects around the world, I've been a couple of times to Israel to try to learn a little bit about the, the kibbutz process and why uh, there's, a lot, there's just five of them alive today, at least two years ago. And one of the main things is to take a property out of the table. 
So to, to be part of the, the, the project, you don't need to buy anything. You don't need to have money to buy. And you, since you're not going to buy anything, you're not, you're not owner of anything. You have long-term access to be there and working together with other families. Uh, we would need some more time to explain that in details, but I'm working on the legal issues uh, to guarantee that as a family comes and start working with no property security, uh, depends on the term of the project, it's a short term or if it's a long term, you have the guarantees that you're going to be harvesting or have the returns over the investment that you have done. But it's making a lot of sense for us to take property out of the table, including myself. I'm We're working on a project that I don't want to be the owner in 35 years, in 40 years. So I need to get him out of the property as the community anyhow uh, started to have a, a co-management system without being owner of a specific piece of the land. Did I answer your question, Andrew? I think you answered part of it. Okay. <laughs> uh, and maybe maybe there's a longer conversation to be had at a different time um, about what happens when people move into a place of, I've heard it called, uh, non-trivial reactivity. Okay, I would that love is, to listen from you, uh, to learn from you. you. That is an explanation. Yeah. Non-trivial reactivity. Non -trivial reactiv reactivity would be uh, when someone is so upset with someone else uh, that they have lost their ability to think in a constructive way and just go into an obstinate place of uh, seeking revenge. That would be, that would be an example of non-trivial reactivity. <laughs> Andrew speaks from that. experience here. <laughs> Absolutely. Were you the one or no? I won't. I won't ask. But uh, sorry, well, Miguel had his hand <laughs> raised. Uh, Miguel. Hello, Miguel, um, has... can you hear me? Yes, Miguel, I hear you. Okay, uh, I thought your uh, presentation was extremely interesting. Thank you. I've never seen the sort of an ecological project um, sort of like framed this way with so many components on like that you're trying to incorporate. But I have a question, you know, how does the process of like onboarding these families onto your land work like how do you recruit them and how do you ensure that all these families are there to contribute to the cause rather than just to find an alternative for housing because it seems like they've been displaced by the government from some previous region and now they're in this new region and it's a tough situation for them, of course. And they might just see the land as an opportunity to find somewhere to go live. So how would you ensure uh, that you're recruiting people that are actually there with the intention to contribute to your project and, well, the community's project, not your project? But yeah, that's my question. Okay. Uh, at the beginning, I thought that I, as my example uh, from Sao Paulo, from a huge city, uh, starting a, a, a dream to be living again in harmony with nature, I thought that that kind of families would be the main focus. People from bigger cities that wanted to, to come to live uh, in the farm. Since we started the project, we felt that there's a lot of local people that they live there for many years, they have great local knowledge, and they also uh, want to be part of community, but they have a lot of fears because they have 30 years of fighting, of conflicts, and they, they need the time to trust in a new process. And what, what I figure out, it's not like a recruiting, selecting recruiting process. Uh, what is happening, we are making the projects grow, we are giving visibility to the projects and we are receiving people that come comes to, to, to be in the hotel as a regular tourist, people that comes with corporations to make their immersions on 
with generative leadership, on ODSs, on circular economy. Uh, we are uh, opening the hotel and the farm, the projects to local schools, to cities on the neighborhood. So since we working on the projects, give a visibility on them, uh, open the space to, to have people coming, we are uh, our, always listening to people that want to know more about how the, 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 the product works. And so it's not a, it's a slow moving process. Uh, and I believe that we need to be really careful uh, in general, as I would say, uh, to work on this uh, onboarding, on this first uh, commitment to be working and living together. Uh, and we need to have a very easy way out, very easy. So if you want to go, it's pretty easy. Since you don't owe anything, it's easy to not uh, to 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 move or to pivot. So I I I would say to you that we are not recruiting. We are giving visibility and and provoking interaction situations to be talking to each family or each couple or each people. How can we make the project together? And we have a structure, internal structure, which is not a business accelerator. Uh, it's it's a bio business cultivator. So we have an internal project area that starts helping the farm and the family to talk about the projects and uh, about the investments, about the goals, about the technique, the technologies used, about the resources needed, and then to find how the project's gonna move. Uh, today, the model is the, the farm, the farm itself built the house. It's a very simple and elegant house made by local material uh, and made mostly with local people that are learning to, to build how uh, we build houses in the past. So the first idea is when you, uh, you are a family that come talk to the farms, define a project to do, uh, define a, a, a 10 years uh, first cycle to work together and live with the farm and the farm builds the house inside of this project. And you have part of the project result goes to pay a kind of a condominium of a rental. So that's that's the way that we are working right now. Okay, understood. Thank you, thank you for explaining. Very interesting and thank you for all the information you've shared here. Obrigado. De nada, Miguel. Yeah, do talk to Andrew because Andrew and Lior are living in an Eagle Village. They, they, things could emerge, Guy, that you need to be aware of. Um, there was a question in the chat from the soil regen guy. I, uh, very interesting regarding the social aspects, but could you also describe the plans for restoration? Like, uh, is anyone uh, managing the restoration project itself? Yes, when we, when we define the 24 island, each island of 10 hectare has we have two hectares of agroforestry. So we started to work in an in a island with 10 hectares of agroforest. So we have one island all covered with the agroforest system. Uh, it, it's the business of this island. Now, the river island is the hotel, the business. The agroforest island has 10 hectares of agroforest system already started uh, four to five years ago. So we are learning a lot with this system. And we are, in, 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 uh, in every new island, we have two actors, that's the basic of the concept. We have two actors of, of the, of the of agroforest system. Besides uh, the, the, let's call the root sales, the, the root system of the agroforestry with no animals, with no cattle raising, we have the other system, which is more, more uh, economical and logical way which is the one that I showed with the cattle and with the tick trees. We have four islands with that model, with, with some 40 hectares of this prototype. Since the trees are, are already four years old and 10 meters high, we are already working with the animals, uh, making make their, their role in the system. So uh, all the projects that we have in, in the farm, half of the farm, is natural, natural reforestation. Re re it's a protected legal area, as I mentioned. The other half, we're gonna have 30% of that productive productivity area 
with productive forests, which will uh, convert in 70% of our area of forests. But I could imagine. I remember in our conversation, the land was quite degraded. Um, you said in the beginning of your presentation, um, this is the tropics, just letting go, and it regenerates itself quite fast. Is that is that what you mean with the natural areas? There's no active restoration there, other than letting go and allowing the Amazon forest, I guess. No, half back. half of the farm. It's 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 a natural. It's already preserved. So yeah. we have half of the farm that are already forests that are basically native forests that are having problems with fire every other year. Uh, we are now surrounded by soybean, huge farms. It's, it, it, it has created a disequilibrium on the area. So fires are coming more frequently now. So yeah. this half part of the, the farm, it's a native forest that we need to protect it, not make a, anything else. So we are making all those uh, big uh, with tractors to try to avoid the fire to jump into the forest. The other half of the farm is, as I mentioned, we need to have techniques and use technology to speed up production with natural restore resource and no chemical dependency. Yeah, and 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 so you're 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 basically building fire. Uh... But first, if the fire comes from the soy farms, you're trying to slow it down by making these corridors. And uh, anything you're doing particularly focused on the pesticide pollution coming from those farms? Or is that is, does nature take care of it in where you are? You know, the, the, we, we, until now, uh, the waters are really clear on, on our rivers, but we're starting to have chemicals from the soybeans uh, reaching the subsoil and reaching the river. So we still have time to, to work. We are working on that too. We create a public commit, committee to work with those big farmers to show them uh, all the chemicals that are reaching the water. So we're working on that and we still have time to recover or to avoid uh, a bigger problem. Okay. Um, so region guy again. Uh, are the two hectare agroforestry areas islands or are they continuous, contiguous in some way, connected with corridors? I did not understand well the question. So is the, are the, uh, the, the, the required two hectares of agroforestry on each island, are ah. those agroforestry areas connected with each other in any way or are they islands within the islands, I guess? They are. First step, island within the island. Second step, in the division of the islands, corridors connecting them. Okay. And then a big question yeah. from Harry. Um, you're using teak trees uh, that are endemic to India. Uh, how do you protect against invasive species uh, that are unbalancing ecosystems? Some plants might be fine on a small scale, but disastrous when scaled up. Yeah, it's not the idea to scale up. It's not a monoculture. It's just part of the system. So the teak, as the eucalypto, as we can have the soybean organically produced, it, it's not monoculture and not to scale up. So doing yep. that, we are all taking care of balancing diversity and species inside of the model. All right. And then in the chat, Frank Holtzman is offering some... Uh... I guess some some experience or expertise on water remediation projects. You should try to get in touch. Fantastic. See if there's some Thanks, Frank. There. I'd love to talk. One point that I think it's important to mention is that uh, uh, when we see the farm as a business, it's not a good business. When you see the hotel as a hotel, it's not a good hotel business. When when we see my consulting company from for 20 years as a conventional consulting company, it's not a good business. But today, combining a hotel, a farm, and a consulting company, we're starting to see an integrated sustainable business with future perspective. So that's really important because since I did not took the decision to have soybean monoculture, I have great costs. I have a lot of new variables to deal with, and I don't have the productivity that the agribusiness has. 
So I don't have a business as usual on a very well, uh, it's not a good, a good farm uh, when you look at the conventional business as usual way. The hotel itself, our plan to the hotel is to have the hotel book 20% of its time with people from the corporation that comes to make their immersion. 80% of the time is community working and trust building local process. So uh, we are not looking for, and we, we, we have, we, we're going to have three families uh, uh, making this business running on human scale basis. So we do not compare ourselves to conventional hotels that need to have 70, 70 80% of booking that needs to be fighting against pricing on booking or Airbnb. It's not the way that we, we, we see things on that way. So that's important. When you combine a multi-business, a multi-dimensional value building business with a consulting company, that it's where the money, the main money still coming from the consulting, but gradually uh, converting to the hotel, to the farm and, and, and to the families that are generating value, living and working together there. That's a very important perspective to have. Yeah, yeah, it's it's the, the this is what I remember from our conversation. The project itself is built up out of so many different value creating exercises that it becomes economically viable, and none of them need to be doing great for the project to survive. That's basically what you were saying, right? It's the sum of the whole, uh, and each individual part is not good enough. Will not be value. Will not create enough value to maintain the entire system. It's the it's the, the combination of everything together that will make a system that will flourish. That's how you describe it, right? And I think that's, that's a fascinating yes. idea. Yes. Uh, so uh, you've inspired Hannah. That her dreams are possible. Hannah, your dreams are possible. Um, and then so region a guy again. Uh, it's an interesting question. Is this a true ecosystem restoration community? I know, I'm not even sure as director of the foundation that supports them if there is a definition or is it an eco village that you're creating, which is, I think, what Andrew and Liora, their experience can inform you a lot about. That's that's an interesting question. Uh, I would say that's that's the combination of both, right? Okay. It's an integrated system that in, integrated uh, integrated uh, the, 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 product, the production in harmony with nature and the community building around it. So that's the com that's the good combination. How can we produce in harmony with na in nature using uh, good technology? How you community building and integrate human as part of a big system again? So restore include the, there is a social restoration uh, ongoing there. Our main our main challenge in my region it's not uh, the environment degradation; it's the social degradation. So it's it needs to be a combination of social eco village with a restoration and production plan. Maybe maybe sorry, but there's there's an interesting question about uh, spiritualism, spirit spirituality, but um, and correct me if I'm wrong, you or our Andrew. Are you intending there to be some form of joint governance of the uh, the 500 hectares, or is there not an intent to have governance? You, you talked about shared services, and then there's these these 24 islands where people basically run an agricultural business or anything else they might be wanting to do, right? Next to the two hectares of agroforestry, is there a way that you you envision? Decision making taking place amongst the twenty five, you know, the, what is it? Almost a hundred families that that are going to live there. Uh, well, that's that's one of the basics to search for for uh, decision making and governance process, which is collective. That's mm -hmm. that's the basic of the model. Right? The, the, all the decisions and governance need to be decentralized. Uh, we are we are. Uh, uh, we are studying in the business of the consulting business networks with all yeah. these methodologies of open organizations with holacracy, sociocracy, and, and all these lean technologies. And we are sure that we, we need to use uh, a distributed network governance model. Uh, but we're going to be working on that model as people who arrive and, and, and with, with short cycle of learning and practice 
but towards that direction, Peter, towards to a decentralized and collective yeah. governance model. Yeah. Okay. There's some interesting uh, examples from the Netherlands on decentralized food networks collaborating around cities. Uh, and there's some interesting uh, gamification theories being developed by an organization John has also worked with called AMPT that you might find interesting to look into. Uh, it's 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 not, you know, it, we're so used to governance being a sort of a council coming together and making decisions. There is there is decision making, but it's decentralized. Things happen from sort of a gamification type approach to things like, you know, 17 year olds, 16 year olds playing a game together on the global internet uh, and coming to decisions without sitting down to make decisions. Is that the type of thing you're interested in? Yes. There you go. Uh, we should try to connect. I think anyway, I can answer uh, Jen about the spirituality. There is a question about, please say a bit more about the dimension spirituality. Okay. So uh, since the beginning, uh, we started to make uh, rituals of silence, of meditation, of circular dancing, of uh, walking in the forest, uh, trying to really be uh, in, in a quiet walk in connection with nature. Uh, my mother is a, is a meditation teacher for a lot of years, so she sometimes brings uh, groups of elderly to be, to be in quiet and silent experience with us. If from uh, from three years uh, three years ago, we started with the indigenous of the Acre and Peru. We started to make these uh, ayahuasca uh, rituals. Uh, so they take place with with the the the, the they take place uh, every three months. We have closed groups to twenty up to twenty to twenty five people. The indigenous that make this it's it's a tea made of two herbs one that comes from the masculine energy and the other one for the family energy. And we make this ayahuasca rituals during a week, every four, three to four months. So that's another example of spirituality development. And also we are uh, using for two years, uh, not the, cal the Gregorian calendar, not the mechanical uh, way of deal with time. We're using the law of time. We're using the lunar uh, synchronary as a way uh, to, to, to deal with time, uh, deal with a more artistical and natural time and less an economical and linear time. And we do consider all this uh, law of time and syn lunar synchronary to deal with, with time, uh, a base of the spirituality and reconnection development. Yeah. Applause from the person who asked the question, <laughs> visible in the video. Um, I, there are no more questions. If you have something that you'd like to discuss, a uh, concern you have, uh, Mark is asking about AMPED, A-M-P-E-D. I'll put it in the chat. I'll, I'll look for their website. Uh, Mark, uh, A-M-P-E-D. It's uh, they're, they're in uh, Utrecht. Mark is from the Netherlands, so he knows where that is. Um, and they're looking at working on local food networks and trying to figure out how to make them much more effective without strong central governance systems, building cooperatives or, uh, you know, the way food currently works is there's a central buying organization and that distributes. How can you decentralize that stuff and make it much more sustainable, etc. A fascinating organization, A-M-P-E-D. Um, Anyone else have questions or something you would like to bring in? Or shall we put out the fire and come back next month? <laughs> yes, Eduardo. Welcome, by the way, to the uh, community. <laughs> oh, well, I'm from Brazil also, and I have exchanged a few messages with Guilherme, and I hope we can further contribute to this uh, to the ERC projects in Brazil, but uh, I'm starting also a project in, in near Brasilia, 60 kilometers from Brasilia, we call Paradise on Earth, Paraíso na Terra, and it's 800 actors 
and we we plan to build uh, educational and research project. We already have a quite developed institution there. But what I would like to ask Guilherme is, is how technically how people that arrive in Farm of the Future, uh, what's the relationship between Farm of the Future and the people that arrive? Since they don't own the land, uh, do you have any contract that you know, binds people to the place? Or how do you keep them in the land? Because you no, know, it's not very nice. I, I felt this you know, in our own farm. When people arrive, they are trained, and then they go away when they have enough knowledge. So what kind of uh, relationship, you know, business relationship do you have with the families that arrive and want to work in the land? I think the first is to have a, a entrepreneur entrepreneur relationship, uh, and basically we are uh, we are generating value together, working projects together. So the main contract it's it's an entrepreneurship or business or value generation contract. So if you come to the farm uh, to produce honey because you're an expert on honey, you have heard about the farm of the future. We do have two islands there, 20 hectares, that are located in an area that has a lot of flowers during the whole year. So we can start working on a project. Uh, it, it can take months or years to be well developed, well designed the honey projects in the island that Eduardo is going to be the pioneer. Once it's, and there's a lot of uh, interaction among us, between us, uh, doing this process. So we, we build trust, we design a project with a common future vision, uh, we define uh, our roles and responsibilities with the project. You are going to be make the move in. I really do want to live here. And then we're going to sign a contract. In the case of this example of honey production, it can be a five years contract because we, we can start producing less than one year. You can start producing honey different than uh, a long-term project as, for example, cattle raising or forest. So the first contract is an entrepreneur-entrepreneur contract. And then there is side contracts that regulate some, some activities. For example, uh, the rent that you're going to pay for the house. It's not a, a regular rental because it's attached to the business and project main contract, but it's a rental project. It's a rental contract. So that's the way we are doing uh, so we don't have any, we don't want to keep anybody. You want that me and the other people want to be part and want to be here because we want to be here. That's why I mentioned that to get out needs to be really easy. Really careful yeah. to come in, really easy to get out, to access. When you build uh, a house, for instance, uh, who is investing in the house? The, the person who is arriving or... Do, do you have a joint venture like you you invest part of the money in building you know, houses or any other facilities in, in the in the farm? Both both can work by now since you are on an organic developing process. The farm is being able to, as the family arrives, we have some principles of bioarchitecture. So we have like the, one list of 10 materials that we're going to use. There is, uh, we already have the architecture plans that are modules and, and, and variations, but there is a, a kind of a standardization with a lot of options. If you are a couple, if you want to have kids, if you're already a family of five or six people, if you want to have uh, to, to work with uh, the hotel, having receiving guests in your property, in your, in your house. So there is a lot of possibilities, but inside of a list of materials, inside of some predefined plants, because it's very costly. Uh, we are more than 1,000 from, 1, kilometers from Brasilia. The logistics here is very, very, very expensive. So if you need to bring mat construction material from outside, it's, that's why we're using the teak. The teak, we have a farm one hour from here in Pará that we buy the, the teak that is not good, we buy the, the teak that is not going for exports and we, we produce our own walls using the teak. And then we planted the teak 
uh, to, in 20 years, have uh, own local material to produce the houses. So uh, by now, we are being able to build the house as the family arrives. But I feel that we can have a partnership with some, some company, H3 company, that works with bioconstructions and wants to help the farm to accelerate anyhow uh, the constructions of the house. We may, we may do a, a partnership with the family. It's open for that too, but I don't think it's, it's a good decision because the way, the better decision is to focus the investment with the family in the value generation and, and, and not in cost. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome, Medu. Any other questions? Yes. Fully reasoning. John's still here. It's two thirty in the morning, almost where you are. Oh. <laughs> um, and I think someone else from China is here, also still. Heroic effort. Um, anyone else have uh, an idea, a question, or something? To add? I saw uh, uh, John Yan Jan. No, if you're from this area, it's Yan, but it's from somewhere else. It's Jan. Uh, comparing that to Plum Village, uh, what you're trying to achieve, and with a uh, uh, a piece of wisdom from Henry George uh, about private property uh, in the chat. <laughs> uh, can I can I speak? I'm so slow at writing. Do you hear go me? Go ahead, please. We're at, around the fire. I'm <laughs> I'm just so you know I'm delighted, and the 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 beauty of the uh, mandala, the the that the spiritual mandala, the medicine wheel. You know, like it's all medicine wheel. It seems, and, and to give everyone that autonomy, that wonderful sense of, wow, there is something greater still that we're turning to. We're not trying to make it all happen ourselves. You know, we, we're releasing to, to the beauty of it all. And, and so I just feel that that's the joy and the beauty. It, that's a lot of the message in the Plum Village tradition and inclusiveness and diversity and da da da. And their way of governance is based on how well they speak with one another, deep, deep listening, and then wholesome speech, encouraging speech. Yeah. So it's cool. Was she from Plum, Plum Village? Oh. No, no. I, Name's I Jan. Just, I just have visited. I, I'm not. A, a monastic or 100% there, you know, I, I see Daryl was trying to say something. I have a hand raised by Sue, but Jan, just a, a shameless plug. This is exactly what we're learning at ERC. This letting go is crucial. And uh, if you have time, I, I did it. I was privileged to do a TED talk, TEDx talk here in, at the university. Maybe Kath can share the link where I indeed talk about the formula and how fast things can then progress towards that bad, better path. Sue H from Portugal. Hello, thank you. Um, it, it, I'm very grateful for all the information and um, knowing more about the project. A few years ago, the uh, government of Brazil, I think, and I may be wrong with this, uh, committed with lo a local company to put electricity into the Amazon. And when we visited, there were lots of electrical wires going across water. And often the, these electrical wires fell during storms and you know, electrocuted fish and whatever else. Um, are, you, are you planning to are you even going to use electricity? How does it work? I'm just curious about both electricity and storing water or utilities infrastructure. Um, and practical things about food for families. How, how is all that going to work? Thank you. You're muted. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Sue. One of the dimensions is the renewable energy. Uh, the farm itself, it, it started the projects as a, a carbon positive farm. So everything that we do, 
we make some possible calculations to keep the, for, the farm on a neutral or po carbon, carbon, carbon positive. For an example, on the cottages, on the lodges that we have, we have no walls. And since there is no way to put air conditioning there, because we don't have air conditioning, we use the air conditioned by the forest. So we made a, a, a project where the cottages, the lodges, the bungalows are located inside of the forest. They are built on a techno way or the air circulates a lot. Uh, is it very, very, very fresh? No, it's not very fresh. Is it very hot? It's not very hot. There is no walls, but we don't have air conditioning. We don't have electrical shower. It's, very, it's a very good experience to take shower on a natural water. So we are avoiding to use a lot of electricity. That's the first, the first step. Uh, today we are using, we are on a very, on an area that the energy is very, very expensive, a very, very poor quality. So we use, we have a lot of problems of uh, burning equipment because there is a lot of oscillations. What we have today, it's a prototype in one of the islands using lithium, lithium batteries with solar solar panels. So we are making this prototype to in the, 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 lithium, the lithium batteries, they have pros and contras, but we are using that to move also the batteries in, can, can have the energy moving to. Every island of 10 hectares and three families uh, may, may be living with 20 solar panels and two, two lithium batteries. We don't have that much wind here, so wind is not an option for us. And the rivers that we have, where I am, they, they, they cannot have uh, even that small turbines. Uh, they, they, it's not an option to use the water as an energy source. So we're, today, we're looking for uh, the, the solar. And now, so uh, probably there is projects using uh, methane gas that comes from some process, internal process. It's another issue that we are starting to study, the, the methanol produced for natural process to produce energy. I was wondering yeah, what that wind was. Too. I thought you had a big fan next to your face, but apparently it's the natural flow of air. Your hair was moving. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Terrell, did you want to say something? Because you were unmuted for a second. You're muted now, in case you're wondering. No, I guess not. Um, I see no more questions. Um, I think there's a few people who started ERC initiatives around the world listening, probably with great interest in how you're trying to organize a new community. Uh, and some uh, relationships with indigenous knowledge there. I, I, I can't help but notice our last speaker, Sal, is here, who is also trying to work with indigenous uh, uh, knowledge then in the south, southern Dakotas, the Black Hills of uh, South Dakota, right, Sal? Um, thanks for being here again. Um, we're going to uh, put out the fire, but I see John turned on his camera. So maybe a few final words at 2.30 in the morning from John. Uh, <laughs> Um, I guess uh, it's just a, a pleasure again to see everybody and, and thank you so much for sharing your, your work in, in Brazil. It's exciting and interesting. And I think that um, what we're seeing is that all over the world, there's just kind of different responses, but on the other hand, they they fit with with the place and i think this is this is correct we can't expect to have ideas about <laughs> some places you know from elsewhere we don't need to have um centralized um thought and say like we're going to homogenize all the all the places what we really need is for the people to to who understand their environment 
and are looking at principles to apply these principles everywhere. And so this is exciting and interesting to see this. And, and I think on the, uh, the other thing that comes to mind is that this sort of, I don't, I, you know, unhappiness or whatever's happening in the, in the, in the world today, there just seems to be so much trauma. Um, and, you know, we, we, we really need to counteract this, this kind of unhappiness for ourselves and achieve some sort of lightheartedness going forward because we need to we need to be happy we need to find joy so one of the things that i've been looking at and a lot of the places where we're working closely together with different groups is the idea of um cultural stages where you can have music and theater and poetry and dancing and movies and lectures and so on. Uh, this also ends up attracting people to the place so that, that they come to learn about ecological restoration. And it, it, I think we need to figure out how to celebrate <laughs> And, and another thing that the Native Americans have been talking about is ceremonies. Somehow, we need to kind of think about this. Like, in, the Native Americans often were talking to me about the loss in some sort of modern cultures of, like, things that had been transitional moments for young people as they as they grow up and you know there needs to be really some celebration of this and it's kind of gotten um lost sort of in 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 things and people are not really talking in in many cultures about this but it it seems to be a huge loss for people and they're kind of losing their way <laughs> they don't really know where they are in their lives and certainly i i have to say now um looking at 72 i'm going to be 72 in the new lunar new year so i i'm 71 now and in the new lunar new year and i i think that something has happened to me because i used to Seem, I seem to have pretended that I was never going to get old for a long time. And suddenly I'm unable to do that. I don't know. It, you know, like my knee was hurting the other day. And I thought like, oh, my God, I've never had that before. You know, this is ridiculous. My knee is hurting. And um, I, I think that suddenly I have to, I have to, just like take take more awareness of the fact that like god it's great to be alive every moment is precious and you know we're here we're alive we have a chance to do things we're called <laughs> to do something now if we're if we don't understand you know, um, I kind of, I like comedies uh, when I look at movies because I really can't take some of the, some of the violence and other stuff. So I just li like to watch these comedies, you know, and I, I was looking at this one and they said, um, it, it, it's a hilarious film with Jim Carrey. I don't know if you've liked Jim Carrey movies, but He's 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 looking. He's in despair, and he's saying, "I need a sign." And there's just like, how many signs do you need? You know, like if 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 uh, if a hurricane takes out an entire city, is that a good enough sign? You know, or if there's, do you need do you need to have an undersea 
earthquake that creates a tsunami that takes out multiple nuclear power plants. Is that enough? You know, I mean, like, or do you need, do you need fire tornadoes? I mean, you know, what, what is it going to take for humanity to grasp where we are in human history? at this moment. And we're called now to, to, to really understand this is serious. That we, we can understand this. It's not, it's, it's not an impossibility to understand what we're seeing. And what, I, what I've been talking about with, with the Academy of Science and the Yellow River, um, the Yellow River, um, you know, c- c- commission is that we can see from this one example that if you lose the vegetation then you're you've altered the physics on the planet the surface temperatures are 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 increased wind speed wind direction vortex activity altered all of this. And when you reverse this and you see that in evolutionary time, the, the bio, biology self-organized to alter the physics. And now it's up to us to understand that we can restore the vegetation and restore the soils and protect and increase biodiversity. And in doing that, we're restoring the the balance that helps mitigate and adapt to human-induced climate changes, that helps to restore the natural equilibrium, which we have enjoyed throughout our lives, which created all the, the life support systems on the earth. And You know, the purpose of life, I've said this repeatedly for a long time, is not to go shopping. The, the archaeologists who, who come in the future are going to be looking and saying, what were they thinking about? How, how can we go to this particular strata in, in, in our core sampling and there's just a toxic layer of trash? You know, like, what are we thinking? And so let, I, I, I'm, I'm afraid, you know, we, we need to understand this quickly so that when the future scientists look back, they say that was the moment that they understood and, and restored the balance, not that, that they carried on and just created huge toxic layers. So be happy that you're all part of of this this transition that we're required to do you know and and celebrate it and help the young people see that their future is dependent on this understanding and that mass collaboration and mass participation means we don't have to sit around waiting for governments and international agencies to somehow do this. And, you know, having just gone to the 28th convening of the parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, do not hold your breath for, for those institutions that have actually been created to maintain the status quo to somehow transform themselves into in, 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 into something else. Humanity is going to have to do it. Everybody is required to understand this and, and to participate. So I think you guys are all early adopters and we just need to play more music, have more dances and you know get everybody out there celebrating this because there's no other way further than this. We're, we're looking at terrible violence now. It's, it's Stone Age activities. Anyway, thanks so much for 
having me and I'm very happy to stay up. Next month again then, John, if you're still in China. <laughs> um, I'd like to uh, uh, do a sort of a formal closure so that we can also formally end the video. But feel free to continue the conversation. Um, my family is waiting for me to join them in dinner. I'd like to point out, I'd like to thank Guy for the presentation, but also for all his insights, thoughts, ideas, uh, and, 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 and trying to find a pathway in the place where you are, which I think is, is incredible. And the complexity of everything you thought through is, is enormous. So congratulations on that, Guy. Uh, and thanks for being here. I'd like to point out that there is a donate button to Guy's project on our website. Uh, Guy calls it positive and energy. I call it hard euros and, and USDs. He needs them <laughs> uh, still because so much of it is still in development. If you can't, don't worry about it. It's, uh, I hope he at least inspired you and that you can do something with that inspiration. Uh, next month, we'll be back. I don't know with whom yet, but we'll figure it out in the next few days. And uh, more inspiration to follow every single month. Um, thanks for staying up late or getting up early if you did. And uh, see you next time.